case you've not figured it out, I love talking about wildlife investing. I just I love it. it. I'm eaten up with it. I read about it. I study it. I've learned as much as I possibly can learn about this. And I just love sharing it with other people. So um, my presentation is going to talk a little bit about the marketplace and buying and selling and um, understanding what's actually going on. So the reason for your attendance today uh, is because you want to learn something. You know, you guys are here trying to get more information so that you can improve what you're doing. Um, the thing that, I'm not gonna read all this to you, but I am gonna read the last line. Um, when helping others to succeed, your greatest successes will emerge. Um, I believe this in my heart. And so if you really, if you really wanna get good at something, start teaching somebody else how to do it. Um, Tad Honeycutt is over there in the corner. Um, Tad knows how to do something really well. He is responsible for um, the vast majority of all the capture work that occurs on uh, within our company um, externally. Uh, John Bailey handles everything on our ranches with, he and Tad work together a lot, but Tad is in the process right now of creating uh, a, a team of new and up and coming um, people in the game industry. He's, he's building some teams of people that are out catching game and they are learning the ins and outs and watching him live into this is really a remarkable thing to watch. Um, and, I, and I hope that you'll embrace this as well. So as you get better at what you do, like Warren said in the past, people had a tendency of wanting to hoard information. They didn't want to share dosages. They didn't want to share just little things that made life better um, when it comes to catching animals. And I think that the spirit of that has changed dramatically. So I would like to encourage you to embrace that as well. And if you find something useful here, please share it with others. And if you learn something, please share it with us. Okay, so where, where did all of these animals come from? And I don't think that's a question that people really ask often enough. I think we just take it for granted that some Billy Bob Bubba in the oil patch had a bunch of money and flew a bunch of animals here from Africa. At least that's what people in Maryland think. Um, that's what people around the United States think. And when they hear about our industry, they think of these, hi Ellie, they think about these egotistical people that like shooting animals in a pen and that we've somehow managed to manipulate the government and manipulate Africa to send us these animals. That's, that's really a, a common belief that people have and it's actually not true at all. So what, what is true is that most of the founding animals that we have on our ranches today originated from zoos. San Diego Zoo is one of the most significant contributors. San Antonio Zoo in the 50s and 60s was a significant contributors, um, contributor. But today, right now, like in 2023, on a monthly basis, zoos all across America are shipping us animals. And they don't admit it. They're not wearing that label openly. They're not embracing our relationship, um, but it is happening. And the reason is they too are struggling with how do they stay in business? They're in the business of displaying animals and selling tickets and people like to see babies and they don't have the ability to just go import more animals. The, the importation into the United States of these animals is essentially non-existent for the most part due to hoof and mouth disease. Warren talked about regulation and he talked about illnesses and things like that. And that plays a huge role in why zoos have been forced to create these breeding programs where they're breeding animals uh, for the purpose of genetic diversity. Well, in doing so, zoos, they operate on these postage stamp pieces of property. They don't have room to house all these animals. And so what do they do with them? Well, they send them to us. Like, thank God. Thank God they started sending them to us. In the 20s, it, it happened at King Ranch. And then that grew and grew and grew. And now we have all these amazing species. But the story is not over. There's still lots of species that exist in zoos today that we don't have. There's lots of species of hoofstock that exist um, within American zoos that we do not have that we want. And I've been working my tail off to try to get them, but they don't want to give them to us. They don't want to publicly, openly give them to us. They, they want them to go through these secret channels in order to get here. And that's restricting conservation. It's preventing our growth. It's preventing these species from thriving. And I, and I think it's important that we all recognize and embrace the fact that 
our our forefathers, if you will, are American zoos. That's where these animals came from and continue to do so today. So there have been some imports, but it's a very, very small number. It's not, not large in any way, shape, or form. And today, if you hear about imports um, of hoofstock, and when I say hoofstock, I don't mean rhinos or elephants or hippos. I mean hoofstock as in antelope, uh, cape buffalo, things like that. Um, the importation of those animals for you and I is essentially impossible to accomplish um, for fear of disease. There have been a few imports um, through zoos, but these are species that have been bred within European zoos for many generations, and so they have these assurances that there's not any illness coming with them. As far as embryos and semen, you're, you're just not gonna get them. It's not gonna happen at least today. Maybe there's gonna be a time where we're able to, to do that, but it's not happening today. So um, the only path for our growth is through breeding. It's the only way that we're gonna move forward. We don't have the ability to saturate our market through imports. The zoos are certainly not going to saturate our market through sending us animals. And so the only way that we move our industry ahead is through breeding these animals. And that is where the massive amount of growth has occurred. Have the zoos done a great job? They've done a really great job in many respects, but they don't have a fraction of the animals that we have here in Texas. It's not even, it's just not even close. Okay, so this is the building of the industry, and my eyes are not great, so I have a hard time seeing this from where I'm standing, and these glasses don't help even a little bit. Um, the long and the short of it is, is um, if you would like a copy of this, please let us know, and I'll email this to you. But the industry really started in the 1920s or 30s when the King Ranch, uh, they were able to acquire some Nilgai antelope, and they did so with the purpose of diversifying themselves from the ebb and the flow of the cattle market. And so today... There's free-ranging Nilgai all over South Texas. Those are the direct descendants of these animals that came from San Diego. You can follow this path through going from 1963 all the way through 2018, and you're gonna see where this data came from is that I've been able to identify news articles that exist on the internet dating back many, many years, and they talk very specifically about the number of species that existed on Texas ranches. I've also gone into zoo records and I've been able to tear zoo records apart and identify when the first shipment of a specific species came from a zoo into the state of Texas. And so this data demonstrates kind of how our industry has grown. And the, the reason I show this is that when you look at this, between 19, I'm just gonna say 1963, and let's just say 2010, give or take, there really wasn't a tremendous financial motive for most of the ranchers doing this. It was more of a hobby. It was something they enjoyed doing. It was something they liked from a conservation standpoint. There was a hunting component to it where people, in order to generate revenue, they would sell some hunts and things like that. But the, the vast majority of the people that were involved in this industry, they did it despite the fact that there were a lot of failures, there was very little support, there was a lot of death loss related to capture and movement. Overall, there was a lot of negativity associated with the experience of raising these animals, but because we as people love wildlife and we love animals and we love being able to own them and look at them, even when it hurts, we keep doing it. Even when it sucks some days, we keep doing it. You lose a dog and your heart's broken and what do you do? You get another dog and you go through it all over again. And so, you know, when you go out and you buy a group of sable antelope and they get delivered to your ranch and four of them die, well, you lick your wounds and you get over it a little bit and then you go buy some kudu. And then six months later, you're like, damn it, I'm gonna try those sable again and you buy some more sable. And unfortunately, this cycle kept happening again and again and again. And there was not a great mechanism for people um, to trust the marketplace, but they kept doing it. And the point that I make around this is that even when it wasn't great, the industry kept growing. Even when it was hard and there was a lack of knowledge and there was a lack of help and there was a lack of assistance, the industry kept growing and zoos kept sending us more species. 
We kept expanding, we kept getting bigger, and we kept getting bigger. You'll notice that there were actually quite a few news articles that were put out. Uh, 60 Minutes did a story in 2012. In 2014, there were some regulatory changes around the three amigos, which were the Attics, the Dama Gazelle, and the Scimitar Oryx. Um, and I can't really see the rest of all this, but the long and the short of it is, is that our industry, there was a there was an economic impact study done in 2007 by Texas A&M, and that was at the request of a politician, and I'm sure there were some private landowners involved in making the request, but the long and the short of it is, is that they estimated in 2007 that the economic impact of our industry at that time was $1.3 billion, and that was a long time ago. And there's been a lot happened since then. There has been an enormous amount of growth in our industry. The volume of people that have gotten in, the number of dollars, and then the almighty inflation has occurred. And I, I, don't, I don't have any way of quantifying to you what the economic impact of our industry today is, but I, I have no doubt that it's north of $3 billion. It wouldn't surprise me if it was $5 billion or more. And so our industry is not just a sleepy little thing that nobody knows about. We're a real thing today. We're, we're a real thing, and when you become a real thing where there's a lot of money moving around, you start attracting the attention of regulation. You start attracting the attention of people looking for low-hanging fruit. You start looking for you have people jumping into the industry like I did with absolutely no experience whatsoever. And, and you, this, this happens because it's easy money. It's easy money, it's fun, it's an incredible opportunity. And so there's a lot of things you need to learn as you go through this. But the final thing that I wanna note about this is that in 2018, and again, census data is very, very limited. There's been very little scientific research into this. I happen to have been on thousands of ranches throughout this state. We have caught thousands and thousands and thousands of animals. There are other people in this room that have many more years of experience than I do, and I've called and asked them these questions. How many kudu are there in Texas? How many sable are there? And I've asked lots of questions. And I estimate when you look at super exotics, and I'm not talking about axis and black buck and fallow deer, I'm talking about sable and bongo and springbok and impala, things like that, that we classify as supers. In 2018, I assumed there was somewhere around 100,000 animals, give or take in Texas. That number may be way off. It may be spot on, but I think it's relatively close based on the super exotic species in 18. Now, there's been a lot of growth since then, but that, that is kind of a starting number that I'm operating with from a financial perspective in evaluating our market. So there's a lot that's changed in the last 16 months. So the last time we were here and we did this, there was a feeling in the room of, oh my God, where does it turn? Are we at the saturation point? How much further can it go? Like, is this really gonna keep going in this direction? Well, animal values have continued to soar across the board in essentially every species that we raise. Today, there are multiple live auctions that have been developed by breeders. And when I say live auctions, I don't mean the animal is running through a ring. I mean that people are breeding animals, they're forming groups, they're spending a lot of money to put on events like this, they are selling very, very high quality, legitimate animals in a very sophisticated manner, and people are, are really getting serious about what's going on when it comes to breeding these species. There's a lot of money behind the advancement of this industry today. Um, Numerous new buyers are entering into this marketplace and they're not just from Texas. And so I can just tell you, um, as I look around the room, I know a lot of you and I don't know a lot of you. Uh, the last event we had, we had lots of people I'd never met. Um, the registrations that we've had for the auction, I think we're at well over 400 for registrations for the auction right now. And I'm just gonna estimate that more than half of them I've never heard of. There are more and more and more people getting into this industry every day. I think that is the result of you know, keeping up with the Joneses. I think it's the result of tax reform. I think it's the result of marketing. I think it's the result of positive press that our industry has been getting. But this is growing and growing and growing. 
And as a company, we are doing, I think, a really great job of inviting people that don't live in Texas to get involved in the industry. So there's a lot of new people coming into the industry. And this last thing, the financial services community has embraced wildlife as an investment. And so I'll talk more about this in a minute. But this is, this is really, really important because the financial services industry is very critical of cons and cheats and thieves. They don't do... Uh, an open door policy of if you have a cool idea, they're gonna sell it. You have to really go through significant due diligence. They're gonna dig through your underwear and make sure you're not doing anything you shouldn't do. And then they're gonna watch you for a period of time before they actually get behind you. And so our company has been able to climb that mountain and get over those hurdles. And as the result of that, the financial services community today is saying, we love this industry. In fact, we want more of this industry and it is essentially an unlimited amount of money that is, is willing and capable to flow into this industry, provided that we maintain credibility and that we maintain honesty and that we work together to prevent bad actors from getting involved in this and spoiling it for everybody. Okay, investment, the action or process of investing money or profit for, for a material result. Okay, so this is just a, this is a dumb question, but I'm gonna ask it with a show of hands. How many people in this room are here because they want to make money raising exotic wildlife? That's not very many. I, I figured it would be more. I figured all of you would. And so I'm not doing this just because I love animals. I love animals, truly. I have two little Pomeranians. They're not worth a shit, but I love them. They're great little dogs. They don't make me any money, and I love animals like I love them, okay? But I, I like making money with exotic wildlife. Like, what a better thing than to be able to do what I love and make money at it. And so I, I um, have aggressively pushed forward this concept that this is an investment, and when I first got started doing this, I had some of the old guard tell me, if you want to lose money, then buy exotics. Well, these people have been doing this for 30 years. I'm like, well, either you're stupid or you're lying to me. Well, one or the other, that doesn't make any sense. And, and the truth is, is that these animals, if you treat them like an investment, they will treat you like an investment. If you treat them like a hobby, they're gonna treat you like a hobby. If you, if you uh, let the big freeze come through and you live in Houston and your ranch is in Sonora and you don't take the steps to make sure those animals have water, well, you're not gonna have any animals. Your, your hobby is gonna end up with a great big goose egg. And so I would like to encourage you to think of this as an investment. So again, this is investing and why do people do it? Well, they do it for tax incentives. As Steve talked about, it is tax favored income, fun, and I know none of you guys ever brag about anything, but there might be some bragging rights associated with doing some of this. And so um, that right there, we're pretty proud of having that kudu. And you know, I might have told a story about him a time or two. So there are bragging rights associated with doing this in addition to the investment component. Um, okay, so this sheet, you can't read any of it, but I'm gonna tell you basically what it says, and if you want a copy of it, I'll get it to you. Okay, as Steve talked about, these animals, according to the federal code, okay, under the federal tax code, these animals are business equipment. So they're no different than a tractor or a printing press or, or a caterpillar machine. Um, they're no different than any other business equipment. So a kudu is a tractor. A sable, it's a printing press. It's, if you're in the dry cleaning business, you have to go buy a bunch of equipment in order to press clothes and clean the clothes. That's business equipment. Well, so is a springbok. And they're treated exactly the same under the tax code. And in Texas, we have this special provision that we embrace and love, and it is in our ag code. So in the ag code here in the state of Texas, they designated exotic wildlife as livestock. So we are operating under the pretense that everything we're doing is the same as a cow. Okay, a kudu is a cow, a sable is a sheep, an impala is a goat. 
So these are livestock. And so as the result of them being livestock, we are regulated by a different agency. We're regulated by Texas Animal Health Commission. There is some regulation from Parks and Wildlife, but from a tax standpoint, they're livestock. And under the federal code, livestock is business equipment. And it's really important because it plays a huge role in the way in which the, what you're doing is treated as a from a tax standpoint. In 2017, and Steve can reiterate this, there was some a lack of clarity in the law with respect to depreciation because of the difference between new equipment and used equipment. So when I buy a kudu that's five years old and she's new to me, well, is it a new kudu? Well, technically it's a used kudu, depending on whether she was with a bull or not. But at the end of the day, she's new to me. And so there was a lack of clarity in the law, but most people took the position that this was new equipment. Well, when the law changed in 17, it now includes new and used equipment. So that's no longer, it's no longer relevant. And so the point of this is that what we're doing is that we're buying an asset that's business equipment and we're depreciating it under section 179 and then we're getting bonus depreciation under 168K and under the ag code, in Texas, they are, def they are defined as livestock. So if you have a CPA that's giving you a heartache about what you're doing or what you're telling them from a deduction standpoint, reference the ag code under livestock and the definition of what livestock is and business equipment under the federal code for depreciation and bonus depreciation. Tax strategy, you're converting a ranch, which is a vacation home, into an economic enterprise. So under the tax code, a vacation property is not tax deductible. Can't do anything with it, other than just use taxed money to pay for it. It doesn't make you any money, it doesn't do anything for you. If you do a VRBO or something like that, well then now you have a rental property which is taxed completely differently. But your ranch, it's a vacation property. So what that means is that if you don't have a viable business on your ranch, nothing you're doing is tax deductible. Your ranch manager is not tax deductible. Your fences are not deductible. Your shelters, your feed, your buggies, gasoline, any of it, diesel, none of it is deductible, which means you're having to pay for that with money that has already been taxed at 37.5%. But if you have a business enterprise, which is a breeding operation, suddenly your vacation property is something that's very different. It, it is now a, I, I don't use that word um, that starts with an S and sounds like helter, but it, it's, it's, um, it's now a tax strategy is what it is because your ranch that's breeding all these various species while you're getting bragging rights and you're getting income and you're getting fun and all these things, suddenly, your fence, your roads, your pond, your feed, your, your buggies, um, your employees, um, your lazy son who is working there, it's all now tax deductible, okay? My lazy son isn't working for me. I'm just, I'm talking about somebody else, but I'm just saying that the, the reality is is that you get all these tax strategies with what you're doing simply as the result of buying a male and a female animal. If you only have males, you own inventory, Inventory is non-deductible, okay? Meaning that you're buying something, you're holding it, you're thinking you're gonna shoot it later, or you're gonna grow it out until it gets big and then you're gonna sell it to somebody. That's inventory, it's non-deductible. The way that works is that when you sell it, you get to offset the price you paid versus what you sold it for and you pay tax on the difference and it's active income if you held it for less than a year. And so if you're a breeding operation, you're treated totally different. So if you think that um, you're getting deductions by owning a bunch of male Impala, you're not. You're, you're not actually in a situation where you're getting the benefits of being a, bre a breeder. So again, we're utilizing depreciation. The animals are business equipment. One of the wonderful things about this is that if you buy a tractor, okay? So if I were to go out and buy a tractor today, okay? And I were to pay $100,000, okay? Mm, a year from now, somebody tell me just a roundabout guess, what's my $100,000 tractor, $100, tractor worth a year from now? Anybody got a guess? How much? Just get, give me a guess. 75. 75 grand. So I bought a tractor for 100 grand. A year later, it's worth $75,000. So $25,000 of my money is gone. It's gone, right? And if I just left it sitting there, 
all I have is a tractor that's worth less money. I didn't get anything out of it. I, if I want something to happen, I have to hire somebody to get on it and ride it, and I have to pay fuel and all those sort of things, right? But if I bought a kudu, or let's say two kudu, let's say I spent $100,000 and I bought two kudu a year ago, okay? How much are my kudu worth today? Well, based on what the market's been doing for the last eight years or so, they've gone up 30 or 40%. They've gone up in value just because you own them. And if while you were in Houston, if you had a bull, they were out there playing hanky-panky, and hopefully you end up coming back and you've got two babies on the ground. And you didn't have to have an operator to do it. Nobody's out there playing love songs for them or giving them flowers or telling them they're beautiful. They just do it automatically. And, and so it's like when you look at this from an investment standpoint, you're dealing with a totally different type of business equipment. It's business equipment that actually appreciates in value, they multiply, and your offspring, when you sell them, they're tax favored. So as long as you hold them for a year, you're taxed at capital gain, long-term capital gains rate, whereas your business equipment, your tractor, if you use that tractor to generate income, you're paying active income rates on that, which is 37.5% versus, as Steve said, it could be as little as 0%, but it's, I think, a maximum of 21%. So it's a huge tax savings no matter how you look at it. So deploying capital. So I know all of you came here to spend money. That's what I was told anyways. You guys are all here for the auction tonight and you brought your checkbooks. You're here to deploy capital, okay? And so when you're making your investments, it is imperative that you use sound judgment and a well thought out strategy. So don't let my manipulative tactics affect you today, okay? So you need to be thoughtful about what you're doing and have a plan. Don't get drunk at the Kentucky Derby later and then come in here and start raising your hand. Just kidding. Okay, so the fact is we highly encourage you to develop a plan and be thoughtful about what you're doing. It doesn't mean you can't be careless occasionally. It doesn't mean you can't get you know, excited and do something at an auction. But when you're buying animals on a daily basis or day-to-day -day basis, whatever it may be, you use your brain. When, when you have a million dollars and you're going to go put it in the stock market, you don't just throw darts at a dartboard. You, you don't go buy a company's stock because there's a beautiful woman in an advertisement. You don't do that. You would never do that. You're very thoughtful about where you put your money. You think very, very thoroughly about how you go about doing this. And if you don't, you're going to lose. And it's no different with exotic wildlife. If you don't think about what you're doing as you're deploying capital, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, you are going to get taken advantage of. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit how you're going to make these mistakes. So understanding the marketplace is critical to your success. So we're going to talk about how you buy animals, live auctions, which are retail, okay? And not all live auctions are the same. So when you look at breeder auctions, okay, these are some of the pros and the cons. When you're at a breeder auction, the animals are coming from reputable, reputable breeders. Most of the, there's there, most info about the animal and the seller is generally known. Warranties are generally included. Um, they occur occasionally and they're in person and online. There's a large variety of species and they can be a source of entertainment. So I'm gonna use an example. Some friends of mine, uh, uh, Will Scott, they have Star S Ranch. They had an auction just recently. They have a group of ranches that participate in this. It is a world-class event. They do a really great job of putting this thing on. And when you go buy something there, they're giving you guarantees. They're telling you up front what you're buying. They're giving you a guarantee about what you're buying. You're getting a lot of information about that animal. They're giving you as much transparency as they can. They're giving you disclosure about what it is that you're buying. And this is a great, great, great situation that's very different from what occurred five, six, seven, eight, ten years ago. It, it is a great source of entertainment, which I think you'll see tonight. Hopefully we fit into this category as well. The cons of this are is that the prices can be higher. When you're buying an animal that's coming with full disclosure and you're buying it from reputable breeders, it is highly probable that you're gonna pay more money than when you're buying it from someone that's not giving you a lot of information. And so with the benefits comes the price. And so you have to think about that and you've gotta weigh whether or not this is worth it to you when you're in the process of buying. So full consignment auctions, the, these are just consignment auctions. So the pros, um, you get immediate acquisition, they occur constantly online. We actually have a, a we, 
we have an online auction that functions every day of the week. Our, our, ours is called exoticauction.com. There are animals on there today, so if you're itching to spend money before the auction later, you can go bid on those animals. They're on there right now. So there are other companies that are out marketing uh, online on a daily basis. There's wildlifebuyer.com, there's TO Global, I think there's a few others that are out there. I think the EWA may have one, but the long and the short of it is you can get instant entertainment, you can buy them from your desk at work during the day, you can see and get a lot of education about pricing. The cons are typically on these type auctions as a general rule, it's not true with us, but as a general rule it is true, you don't get a guarantee. There's very limited information about the seller, and in most cases, the seller is not disclosed, so you don't know where it's coming from. The animal has passed through at least two hands before it's gotten to you. Again, there's limited disclosure, and there is higher mortality on these types of sales than there are on the others, and that is due to stress. The animal is sitting in a barn for a longer period of time. You, you, you don't know exactly the history. That animal could have been through multiple hands before it gets to you. You don't know any of that backstory. All you know is they open the gate at your ranch, and you find an animal dead two days later. And so... It doesn't mean this is not a great way to buy animals. It just means that you have to be thoughtful about how you're doing it. You should be able to get a better deal when you're buying animal through these venues simply because it's it's just a different it's a different type of disclosure. It's you, you all know you can buy the same product in lots of places but you're not getting the same product. You, you can go and buy a car at one dealer or you can go buy a car at a used dealer. You're not getting the same thing even though the, the tag on the vehicle says it's the same. Video sales and retail. So these are a lot of fun. They're entertaining. Immediate acquisition. There are some guarantees. The seller is identified. These are like DV auctions, okay? We have DV auction hosting our event tonight. So you can sit at home if you can't be here. You can watch everything that's going on. You don't have to raise your hand in public to where your buddy is gonna be bidding you up. You, you can do this very privately. In fact, it's actually funny. At our live auction, there's lots of people that have computers on their table and they're bidding online. Even though they're in the room, they're not raising their hand. It's great to watch the strategy, I enjoy it. So the cons to this are there's only a few of them per year. They don't happen all the time. Your payment is going to be made before the delivery, and warranty is very, it's typically it's very limited. Okay, so brokers. So, look, brokers have kept this business alive for 50 years. They are the reason that the industry exists today. It is, it is unquestionable. This is the reason that all these ranches wound up with animals was brokers. And it was, it's a different day today than it was 25 years ago. It's a lot, it's a lot more, um, the, the playing field is more fair, we'll say today, than it was 10 years ago for a landowner. So the pros are is that when you're dealing with a broker and you're buying at retail, this animal is being delivered to your ranch you're getting some guarantees depending upon the broker. Not all brokers give a guarantee, but some of them do. There's hundreds to choose from. I mean, really, you, you can find a broker. If you go on Facebook today and you just start looking for exotic animals, you'll find 20 brokers in 30 minutes. They're everywhere. You can find them all over the place. And you can take your pick of who you want to deal with. You can develop a personal relationship with the person that you're working with, and those relationships become very valuable over time, and hopefully they involve some consulting. They come with, they can come with some education and consulting. Delivery is typically included, and again, some of them offer full disclosure. The downside, not all brokers are credible. And for anybody that's in this room that's been doing this for any period of time, you will have learned that not all brokers are credible. And I have no problem saying that real loud. I don't have the need to point a finger at anybody or say anybody's name or point anybody out. I'm telling you, do your homework. Before you pull the trigger, do your homework. There are people that will rob you blind and laugh while they're doing it. And it's been done to me. I've had it happen. And I create nicknames for these people. I'm not going to share them with you, but I, I create nicknames because it makes me laugh later. But just... Just be thoughtful, ask questions, make sure that you're, you're identifying who you're dealing with. Not all brokers can offer a guarantee, and I use the word can on purpose, okay? A lot of them would, but not all of them can. You're dealing with animals that are worth 50 grand, 70 grand, 100 grand, 250, 300, 500 grand, and 790 for a Cape Buffalo not long ago. So 
there's not a lot of people out there brokering game that have the financial resources to warranty the value of these animals. They just don't have the ability to do it. And so you need to ask yourself the question when you're buying these high dollar animals, whether or not you're willing to buy them from someone that cannot guarantee them or will not guarantee them. Is it worth going out and buying a kudu for $35,000 from someone that's not gonna guarantee it versus 50 from someone that will? Well, that's just a decision you have to make based on the information that you have. I can tell you that there are times I buy animals without warranty. I, I do it all the time and I don't hesitate in doing it, but the price has to match what I'm buying. And so I would encourage you to think about these things when you're buying. And so uh, not all brokers are willing to provide animal information, history, health issues, et cetera. So as a general rule, if I'm selling you an animal and you ask me where I bought it from, I'm gonna tell you. If you ask me what I paid for it, I'm gonna tell you. And there's a reason that I'm gonna do that. And it's because I'm a capitalist and I'm not ashamed. So as a general rule, we're trying to make 30% margin across the board. That means that some stuff we make $0 on, some stuff we make a 60% margin on. It just depends on the animal, but I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not here because this is a hobby or because it's altruism. I'm here because we're building a, a business, we're employing lots of people, we're growing an industry, we're making an investment, and we want to make money just like you do. And so the people that you're working with, they should make money. If they're, if they're bringing you animals to your ranch and dropping them off, they should make money. There's no reason that they should not make money. It doesn't mean they shouldn't have risk, but if they're not willing to tell you any information about the animal and they're not willing to give you any disclosure about what's going on, I would just take a hard pass. That's just my personal opinion. You can make your own decision, but buyer beware that when you're buying something that does not give disclosure, that violates this principle of investing. When you make an investment in the United States, there are laws that require full disclosure. The SEC requires this, not with animals, but they require it with stocks and bonds. And you know, if you buy a piece of real estate, you're gonna get all the disclosure about that real estate. And it's to protect buyers, but not really. It's actually to protect the marketplace. That the government wants us to have sound marketplaces to encourage investment. And so when you have organizations that are not providing disclosure, you just have to recognize there is a reason why. And so it doesn't mean don't buy it, it just means get ready to find it dead. It may live, it may have a baby, and you may end up getting a great deal. It's the worst thing that could ever happen to you because you'll do it again. And eventually it's gonna get you. Okay, breeders, retail versus wholesale. Okay, so buying retail versus buying wholesale. So the difference between these two is, is that if you're buying retail, the animal's getting dropped off at your place. If you're buying wholesale, well, that means you gotta go get it, go catch it, it's up to you. So the pros of buying at retail, typically you get a warranty, the disclosure of the known history of the animal, you generally get help and education. We already went over this to some extent. Okay, so places to purchase. So when buying animals, ask yourself the following questions. Am I getting enough information? Is there a warranty? Will I get any assistance? And this is a really important one. How bad do I want it? Like, you can violate every rule under the sun when it comes to investing if you want it bad enough. Okay, so you have to ask yourself this question. Like, your gut may be telling you don't do it. Your brain may be saying don't do it. Like, your friend, your wife, your partner may say don't do it, but I've done it. <laughs> and, and I know you have too. And so this is just something you've got to approach this from the standpoint of I'm going in with my eyes wide open. I know that I'm subjecting myself to risk. I know I am. I know that I'm getting myself into a situation where this may not work out. And so when you walk out in the pasture and you find the animal dead in the water hole, you can't be mad at the other side. Like, you did it. You made the decision to violate the rules. You, you knew what you were doing going into it. And so you can suck on your thumb and be mad all day long, but there's no reason to get mad at anybody else because you broke the rules. And so this how bad do I want it is something just go in with your eyes wide open. And the last thing is, is it priced to match the risk associated with the purchase? And I, and I think this is just good decision making. It's just good business. Risk, um, 
it accompanies everything that we do in investing. It accompanies everything we do in life. And so when you take a greater risk when you're buying animals, the price should be less. If you're taking lower risk, well, then the price is going to be more. So you just have to find your sweet spot on where you want to live and kind of stay within that realm. And I think if you do that, you'll find that you're quite successful. It's when you start getting out into those gray areas where you're uncomfortable that you start losing sleep at night. I, I won't use his name, but I'll give you an example. I have a, a fr he's a friend and, and he's a customer. Um, he is extraordinarily wealthy. Very, very, very wealthy. Has a really big ranch. He, he can't sleep at night if he has a kudu female that's out running on his ranch. He just can't fathom the idea of not being able to see it and look at it and touch it and feel it and know it's right there. He just can't do it. It, it's, it doesn't matter he's got a gazillion dollars, $40,000 or $50,000. It, it affects him so poorly that it keeps him up at night. So... I would be an idiot to sell him one. I would be dumb to sell him one. I, I mean, even if I talked him into it, I would be dumb. And the reason is he is going to call me. Brian, I haven't seen that kudu in two weeks. Huh. Well, you got 3,000 acres. You know, I don't know what you expected. Those, those Himalayan tar, I, I know. <laughs> You're not going to see them either. And, and so the deal is, is like it's, I have to be thoughtful about what I'm doing as I'm going through this process because the last thing I want to do is put somebody in a situation where they're uncomfortable. And if you're selling your animals to somebody else, just, it, it's not worth the money to sell somebody something that's going to cause them and you grief later on. Selling exotics and liquidation. Okay, so similar to purchasing exotics, selling them requires understanding uh, the different channels of the market. So I want to back up just quickly for a moment. So when you think about investing, there's a couple of things that are really necessary in order for this to be sound. When you're buying, you have to have a really trustworthy place to buy. You have to be able to trust the market when you're buying. And the same thing is true when you're selling. If you don't have the ability to liquidate and actually get money in your hand, well, then it's a bad deal. Like it's not an investment if you can't liquidate it. I don't know if anybody in here has ever bought gold coins, I, I bought gold coins one time. It's really easy to buy them. It's a lot more difficult to sell them for what you, what you bought them for. And it's because there's a middleman in between. And so you just have to understand the market and how all this works when it comes to approaching this from an investment standpoint. So we went over a little bit of the buying side. The selling side is exactly the same. So if you have a ranch, you're going to produce offspring, hopefully. Now you need to liquidate your animals. Well, somebody has to catch them. And if it's going to be you, well, you put on your seatbelt and get ready because you're in for a ride. It's going to be a rodeo. It's a lot of fun, but it's work and it's dangerous, as Warren talked about. And so you can sell direct to a landowner, you can sell your animals to a broker, or you can sell them through auctions. Knowing the pros and the cons of each of these is really important. So direct to the landowner, you're going to get a retail price. So when you get a retail price, that means more money but it also means that you're carrying the risk. So you're gonna manage the transaction and you decide who you deal with. So the cons are you have to provide a warranty. And I say you have to provide a warranty. That may not actually be true. I would tell you that it is. And the reason I say that is if you're a landowner and you're raising animals and you're breeding them and you're selling them, there's gonna come a time where things go wrong. It's just the way it is. And do you want your, per, your buddy or your friend or your customer having a bad experience and calling you and telling you, hey, that animal you sold me last week, it died. I found it dead. And the answer is no, you don't want to deal with that. And at the end of the day, there's enough margin in what we're doing. There's enough profit. And through breeding, it's not difficult to make money even when you're warranting animals, as long as you've got a little bit of volume. <clears throat> so you have to carry the risk of death loss. So this is just the way it is. It goes hand in hand with the warranty. You have to do the capture work and you have to manage the delivery. And I will tell you that if you've ever done any of this on any kind of large scale, you will begin to understand why it is that brokers are worth their money. You will understand why it's worth working with a broker because, look, you may just love doing this. I do. Okay, I started out as a guy just breeding animals, but I love this part of the business, and so I benefit from it, but it comes with a lot of heartache. It comes with a lot of grief, and it comes with a lot of stress, and it comes with a lot of injuries, a lot of them. We're in a helicopter all the time, and if my phone rings 
I, I answer it. I, I, I have people in the field, I worry about them every day, all day. You know, they're flying around in a helicopter, that tail's swinging by trees, and things happen. It's just the way it is. Our, our people, they get hurt. We have injuries. It's just the way it is. I got a fallow buck to the thigh because I was an idiot, and I was experimenting with BAM to see how little I could get away with using. <laughs> and I can tell you, I was stronger than that fallow buck for a little while. And I was stronger with him while he was trying to get away. But the minute that he decided to kick my ass, I was not stronger than him. And he put his brow tine straight into my thigh. And I'm very lucky to be standing here today. The, the antler went directly in my thigh, right by my artery. And fortunately, I just ended up with a puncture wound. But if you're going to do this side of this, buy a good first aid kit because you're going to need it. Brokers wholesale. The pros are they do the capture. They come do this for you. They make your life a lot easier. You can make them carry the risk of death loss. They should be able to make enough money selling your animals into the retail market that even if something dies, they still make money. That They should. You should give them enough margin. When they're buying your animals, you should give them enough margin so that if something goes wrong, they don't lose money. You don't want them to lose money. You want them to be able to survive and do this for a living because they provide a great service. And so in this, in this situation, they carry the risk, but you have an obligation to make sure that there's enough margin there for them to be able to do it. They manage all the deliveries. I'm sure you don't want to drive until two o'clock in the morning delivering out to San Angelo or West Texas, and you don't have to provide a warranty. They, they handle all that. The cons are somebody's going to be on your property. You have the risk of non-payment, bad checks. You didn't get the wire. They said it was coming, and it's not. Um, you have the risk of accidents. You're only going to get paid wholesale prices. Some of the brokers either refuse or cannot carry death loss. So again, this is all manageable. Warren talked about contracts. We use contracts with what we do. So it's all manageable. As long as you communicate your intent and what you're wanting, if you understand the retail market and you understand the wholesale market, you can craft a deal that is fair for a broker and you can eliminate a lot of the risk that you would be taking otherwise. And I'm not telling you which way to go because everybody's got to make their own decision about what's best for them. But at the end of the day, there are ways to mitigate risk while still maximizing your gains. Auction, these can be below retail, above wholesale. So the pros are you can get really high retail prices. So if you're selling animals at auction, uh, my good friend here, Colby, he sold some animals at auction. And he has seen the benefit of doing this. Uh, you've had some surprises where it's like, wow, like, can we do that four more times? And that's the benefit of an auction is that magical things happen in auctions. And people say, there's no way that's real. I can tell you it's real. I've watched it with my own eyes. I've seen the checks change hands and the animals get delivered. It is real. When you see a price at an auction and it's astronomical, I'm telling you it's real. It's not fake. And it's the result of a buying frenzy. It's the result of how bad do you want it? And that's just the way the market works in these live auctions. Um, okay, so you don't necessarily need a warranty at these um, when you're selling them. Some of the times you do, it just depends. And you can have anonymity if you're selling at a live auction if you want it. I don't like it, but you can have it in some cases. The cons are you have to capture the animal. You're going to have to pay a commission to the auction house. And the downside is your animal may not bring anything. You may not have a buyer there that day. It may not work out very well. And the animal you thought was gonna sell for 10 grand may only bring four. And it happens. And you have the right to PO that animal and not sell it, but it's disheartening, it's frustrating. You had the animal, you wanted it to go, and it didn't work out. So these are the pros and the cons there. Purchasing and liquidation summary. Okay, the following, these are critically important, as I said, understanding the difference between wholesale and retail. Always ask the question, Always, when you're buying an animal or selling an animal, always ask yourself the question, what is wholesale and retail? Find out what the market is. Just ask. If you want to know, ask us. We'll give you the information. I'll give you pricing for the last five years if you want it. Wholesale and retail. We keep this on every species that we work with. And so it's really important that you know this. Making choices based on convenience, risk tolerance, and investment strategy. Deciding if a warranty and disclosure matters to you. Determining who is responsible for death loss. And to sum this up, there is no best case scenario for everybody in this room. 
It is purely based on your individual preference. It is purely based on what you want to do, but knowledge is what is going to help you to be successful. And if you manage this correctly, it will work out well and you'll get better at it over time. But just don't go in blindly buying animals off the back of a trailer because some guy called you or messaged you on Facebook. Be a little more thoughtful about what you're doing because otherwise you're going to be the guy telling people, oh, well, if, <laughs> if you want to lose money, then buy exotics. It's, it's absolutely not the case. Okay, market performance. I'm going to try to buzz through some of this pretty quickly here. So 18 months ago, man, there's just no way this can keep going. Well, that last blue line that you see there, uh, that is since our last meeting. So I'm not going to go over all these, but these go back, um, I believe this is 2012 through 2022. We are continuing to see massive increases in prices across the board on every super exotic species that exist. It's just, it is the way the market is. I'm going to try to tell you why as quickly as I can. This is a typical investment performance. I can email these to you. I'm going to run through it real quick. You buy one male, five females. 10000 on the male, 80000 on the females. You got $410,000 invested. Your, your offspring per female, okay, is uh, per female is one. So the total offspring at an 80% rate is four. You got five mamas, 80% calving rate. You get four babies. Follow me on that? Okay, you get one, two males and two females at wholesale, not retail, but at wholesale. You see, you paid 80,000 and 10,000. Now you're selling them for 70 and 60. So you're not getting retail here, okay? So you've got $14,000 worth of male babies and $120,000 worth of female babies. Your cash flow is $134,000, which is 33%. I don't know if you have lots of places where you can get 33% on your money, but I don't. And so the secret here is keep them alive and don't waste a bunch of money. You've got to be thoughtful about the way you manage your ranch. If you put all these animals in a pen, you're God. You have to feed them 3% of their body weight every day. Feed costs are about $500 a ton or more right now. Calculate that out and figure out what your expenses are. Kevin's favorite word is land, 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 land. We need more land. And the idea of that is the animals are more healthy when they're eating natural forage and it costs you less money. So stock your ranch appropriately and your overhead goes down and your production rates go up. But at the end of the day, $134,000 return on $410,000 invested and you still own the animals and they're tax deductible and it's tax favored income is a pretty dang good deal. And this is one of my favorite parts about this. And again, I'm going to try to burn through this pretty quickly. I know that when I tell myself in the mirror how smart I am, that it sounds really good. And I, I know that it looks like I had great foresight into our industry based on what's happened over the last eight years. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't create any of this. I didn't invent any of this. I didn't make any of this up. I went to South Africa and I met some breeders in South Africa. I learned about the market in South Africa. I studied what happened there. I looked at the economic viability of what happened there. I saw the massive increase. I saw the massive decrease. And I'm now seeing the recovery. This has already been done. So if you want to know, where is the saturation point? Where are we going? What's going to happen? The map is already created. It's already written. All you got to do is look at it. In 1991 in South Africa, they created a law called the Game Theft Act. They privatized ownership of game. That means that landowners own the animals on their ranch. That was not the case before. It's kind of like what white-tailed deer breeders want now. They want to own the deer, but the state doesn't let them. So in South Africa, they said, we're going to let you own the game that's on your ranch. At that time, it was estimated there was about 100,000 animals left. I think that the, the terminology, to be, say it correctly, is in private hands. Wildlife had been decimated due to farming. There's a lot of hungry people in Africa, so they got to feed them. And so a kudu was not worth as much as soybeans were. So all this natural habitat between the 1800s and the, the late 1900s, they just wiped it out. They killed all the birds and the butterflies and the caterpillars and the antelope and the leopards and the cape buffalo and the giraffe. They decimated them because they had no economic value. Well, suddenly in 1991, they were given economic value. And that resulted in $4.5 billion of investment into wildlife ranching. 
50 million dollars or 50 million acres of marginal farmland got converted back into natural habitat. And so not only did all the hoofstock benefit, but the birds and the butterflies and the caterpillars and the rabbits and the rats and the lizards, all of it benefited. And so between 1991 and 2018, the market saw compounding increases in value of about 20% per year. In 2014, I believe it was, there was $300 million worth of live animal sales in South Africa. And in 2018, it was estimated that they had gone from about 100,000 animals to somewhere between 20 and 25 million animals over 27 years. It is the greatest conservation success story that I'm aware of. Species like black wildebeest were saved. There's lots of other species that were saved from extinction as the direct result of wildlife ranching in South Africa. So why does that matter to us? Well. Where we are today, right now, if you equate this in South Africa terms, it's about 1995, let's say. 1994 or 1995. Based on population, that's about where we are. Let's just say that my number of 100,000 animals in 2018 was correct. And let's just say today that that number is 300,000. We're just guessing. I don't know it for sure, but let's just guess. 300,000, we got a long ways to go to get to 25 million. And I don't think that people in this state stop to think about this very often. It is inevitable. There are going to be, unless there's some mass casualty, there are going to be 20 million animals that are non-native in this state at some point. When? I don't know. But the map is already written. It took 27 years in South Africa. We're, we're not their native range, so we're probably dealing with some different circumstances. But at the end of the day, we're not gonna have 300,000 animals in 10 years. Unless some massive illness comes through and wipes this out or inbreeding takes over and starts creating problems, we are headed to 20 million animals. And so the question for you is, if you're in the car, how long do you stay in the car? How long do you ride this out? I'm 48, I don't think I'm gonna see the end of this. I don't think I'm gonna see the downturn before I, I, before I get out of this or I quit doing this. I think we've got many, many, many years in front of us and I'll explain to you why. I'm gonna give you some population numbers really quick, okay? This is a kudu, okay? What, that, that's our kudu. I think he's got a name. I'm not gonna say it, but. So the AZA population of kudu, this is a little dated. I, I haven't updated this in a few months, but the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, they are our great grandparents, if you will, because our animals have come from zoos. They have 60 males and 119 female kudu. That's in all of the AZA. That's the whole thing. That's all of it. Every zoo that's an AZA zoo in America, that's the whole population combined. We have more females than that on our properties. And then there's all of you that have kudu on your properties. So while they are the, the great grandparents, at the end of the day, um, our populations dwarf theirs, but they have this idea that theirs are more important than ours because they have these organized breeding programs, but they do all this scientific work that we don't do that we were talking about earlier. They do the work scientifically, we don't. They keep the records, we don't. And so it will benefit us greatly to start doing that in a better way. But there were 44 founders. What that means is they caught 44 kudu and brought them to the US. Were they related? We don't know. Were they unrelated? We don't know. Most likely, a lot of them were related. But this is what every kudu in America came from, is 44 founders. And about, I'm gonna say about 20 of those more than likely did not come from Africa. They probably came from here. But if you wanna know the regions where they came from, these records are online, you can access them online. But the estimated population in the United States, I'm guessing there's about 5,000 kudu, somewhere in that range. It may be more than that, it may be less than that, but I, I think it's within a stone's throw. Monthly female sales. Again, this is a guess. I don't think it's this high. I'm trying to go on the high side just to, to be aggressive. 50. 50 female kudu sold in a month. That's not very many. And why? Well, it's because Billy Bob doesn't want to sell his kudu. He likes them. The hardest part of what we do is getting people to sell us animals. 
inventory is the key to this industry and getting inventory is hard. And so when you look at these populations and you look at the marketplace and you look at who owns them, wealthy people own the animals. While they do want some cash flow, they fall in love. And as the result of that, the marketplace is very restricted. It's very hard to get kudu females or sable females. You can get a handful of them, but go try to get 50. You're not gonna get 50 very quick. It's gonna take you a while to get there. And so it's a very limited marketplace as it relates to um, available high quality animals. We can use Roan as an example, 40 males, 60 females, total of 16 of them ever imported. Thou less, probably less than a thousand of them. It, there's not 10 females sold in a month, I promise you. It's not anywhere near that. I don't know what it is, but it's not 10. Sable, again, I use the same number here as Kudu, about 5,050, 39 founders total. So Nyala, 28.70 in the zoo, 18 founders, 3,500 approximately population, less than 50 females sold. So when people talk about genetics, I always, I get a kick out of this. I'm not a geneticist, I don't know squat, from what Dr. Durr, you know, knows about genetics. But I always love it when I hear people say, oh, we got great genetics in ours. We have great genetics. I'm like, there's 18 of them that were ever imported. You know, <laughs> we, all have, we all have pretty similar genetics. They're just a little changed up and watered down here and there. But at the end of the day, there's not a lot of diversity in these populations. Fortunately, we haven't seen a lot of bottlenecking in the species that are doing well. But at the end of the day, it's very limited what our genetics are. A spring box, 17 founders, 2,500 animals, less than 20 each month. And I can go through lots of species and give you these numbers, but the point is, is that it is a very limited marketplace. Getting high quality super exotics, it is not easy. You tell me I wanna spend $5 million in animals, I'm gonna say, okay, well, there's a line of other people that wanna do that too. And it's not easy to get you what you want. And if you say, well, I'm used to getting what I want, so is the 10 other people that I'm dealing with. You know, everybody is used to walking in the dealership and getting what they want. That's the way it works when you have money. That's not the way it works when you buy exotics because everybody buying exotics has money. And so the deal is, is like, it is a very, very, very limited and restricted marketplace when you're looking at these high quality animals. And so you can benefit from buying directly from breeders if you want them bad enough because you can get them right away. So again, <clears throat> the significant, there's significant demand in our industry. There's a 50 year old industry. It is made up of wealthy and elite people, 5,000 plus ranches and that is growing. You had this economic impact study done in 2007. The EWA has estimated a $3 billion economic impact. Ranches are converting from livestock to exotics. They're also converting from white-tailed deer to exotics. In 2017, tax reform made this even better. Again, limited supply. You have a low population of super exotics. This gives you more information about the same stuff. And so I want to give you just one last tidbit of insight into why I think that we have a tremendous amount of market stability. And it reiterates some of what I've already said. So <clears throat> what our company has done is that we recognize the personality of the buyer in Texas. Who, who is it? Well, you guys can look at each other and see what you look like and find out what your backgrounds are. But the buyer in Texas doesn't only live in Texas. They live all over America. And they didn't even know this existed. They didn't even know that this industry is here. Maybe if they hunted, maybe they learned something about it. But as a general rule, they didn't know about it. And so we've created this product that is an investment vehicle. And this investment vehicle is structured as a tax strategy and an invest, it's, a, it's an income producing investment. And every single one that we've done since 2016 is making money, all of them. So I'll give you one example, okay? This is our best example and then I'm gonna give you another example. Cape Buffalo, we bought Cape Buffalo in 2017. Two and a half million dollars is what we spent to buy those Cape Buffalo. Net of all fees, of all expenses, I think the total distributions to the partners that bought that investment on two and a half million invested, I think they've gotten back somewhere in the range of six and a half or seven million dollars of cash. That's deliverable cash. That is not a tax write off, that's cash. So the two and a half million turned into a million and a half dollars after tax savings, six and a half or seven million back, and we're sitting on $17 million worth of Buffalo today. That's one investment. We have a, the very first investment that we ever did. 
we were idiots. We did not know what we were doing. We had massive death loss in the very beginning. We were walking around like blind men trying to find our way. That was a $5 million investment. That investment will liquidate this year. Those investors, I don't remember the total distributions, but I think they've gotten back cash of about three or three and a half million dollars. They've got a tax write-off that equaled about two million. So essentially they've done a little better than break even right now, but we're liquidating that joint venture this year. There's another $6 million of distributions coming on that before the end of the year. So that'll be better than a two to one. So these are people that don't live here. They live somewhere else. They live in another state, but they're getting this incredible financial reward from doing what we're all doing. And net of fees, net of all the expenses, it's working and it's working better than investing in some boring stock. But then they get to come here and hang out. They get to see what we do. They get to come to these auctions. They get to go ride in a helicopter. They get to go hang out at our facilities. And what that's done as the broker dealer community has embraced this, is that we have essentially unlimited money being offered to us to fund these projects, but we can't keep up. We're just one company. We can't keep up. We just can't do it. We don't have enough bandwidth to, to, to do it. And so as the demand massively exceeds what it is that we're capable of performing, there's only one thing that can occur, only one. When demand outpaces supply, what happens? Prices go up. It's just the way it works. It's, the, it's just the way it goes. And so what we've done is that this year um, we'll add about, I'm going to say between 30 and $40 million worth of buying power into the state of Texas from external sources. Well, that buying pressure is going to put pressure on all of you. For you that have ranches here, you're trying to buy animals. Well, now you have outsiders trying to buy what is already very limited. And so we have this limited supply in the state. You have all these brokers showing up in the industry. More and more and more landowners are doing this locally. And then you have this external force of people outside the state buying it. And so what this is doing is that graph I showed you of the prices, it's causing everything to skyrocket because the demand is growing far faster than the supply can grow. The only way we can change the supply is through reproductive technology, getting better at feeding, better at parasites, et cetera, getting better at management. And that's really what we're here to do is help get better at management. And so the, the last thing that I'll say about this, it ties into the tax. As long as the federal government allows us to treat these animals as livestock, I don't believe that we have any risk of losing the tax strategies that are in front of us. The percentages may change from time to time, which they always do, but as long as livestock are the same as cows, the cattle lobby is not going to allow the government to take away depreciation. They're just not gonna, the cattle lobby is too big. They're not going to allow us to get hurt from the standpoint of livestock not getting treated as business equipment. And as long as landowners have the ability to write these animals off, they don't even have to make money to want to do it. We've already proven that. There's 40 years of history of people doing this when it didn't work out really well. And now when you factor in tax strategies and you think about this, if I can take my vacation property that I'm paying for with after-tax money, and I can own exotics, and now I get all these deductions on fences and buggies and fuel and all this. If all I do is break even on my money, on the animals, if all I do is break even, I'm still making money because of all the other tax aspects that come along with it. So we don't have to see these massive increases in price. In fact, they're not really good for the industry. It's in our interest that they slow down a little bit, to be honest with you. And so if we see stable growth, not astronomical crazy growth, stable growth makes for a stable industry. And as long as we have great tax law in this country that enables us to get these deductions, and as long as somehow, some way, we can't get inundated with imports, we have a very, very bright future in front of us if we don't screw it up ourselves. And my, my final message is, how are we gonna screw it up? And the way that we're gonna screw it up is we're gonna let somebody get killed. We're, we're gonna let people make dumb decisions. We're gonna let drugs get used on our property in a way that they shouldn't get used. We're gonna have people getting in, car, in accidents hauling a trailer and it's gonna be a catastrophic mess. 
And you can get away with this once or twice or five times, but there comes a point where you don't get away with it anymore. There comes a point where the government says enough is enough. And we are our own worst enemy. We are. It's not the activist. It's not PETA. It's us. And if we don't regulate ourselves and we don't protect what we're doing by using brains and, and, and thoughtfulness related to the decisions that we're making and how we're functioning, and if we don't come together as a group and unify and say, we're going to make sure that we self-regulate. We're going to regulate ourselves. If we don't do that, I feel that the greatest threat to our horizon, which looks really great, is government regulation as the result of really, really dumb decisions that end up getting people killed, whether it's through drugs in the food, whether it's through somebody catching a horn or accidents in a helicopter, whatever. And I'm just, I'm employing you and asking you that I, I'm asking you to get involved. Step up to the plate and say, I want to be more than just a rancher. I want to protect my investment by making sure I make good decisions and that I have a voice in carrying forward this message to ensure that our industry lasts for the next 20, 30, 40 years. We deserve it. The wildlife deserves it. Our kids want to do this.